Hello and uh, good morning everyone and welcome to this DigiPrint Supplies webinar on UV lamps called UV lamps demystified. We're going to uh, talk to you uh, today about UV lamps and everything involved with it, um, meaning um, background information, uh, information on the technology, what exactly is a UV lamp, how is it made, and then uh, further along the road, we'll go into uh, details on how you can um, better handle and maintain and store your UV lamps, how they affect print quality and what you can do about it. And as usual, with our DigiPrint Supplies webinars in the end, there'll be room for questions and answers. Now, today's uh, webinar will be done by uh, David from UV Integration, which is uh, one of the leading European manufacturers of UV lamps and solutions. So I'm happy to um, get David. In the loop. Just make sure that everyone can see him. All right. David, over to you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here talking to you today. Um, I'm just waiting for the uh, presentation to come up on the screen and uh, I will uh, start uh, with the presentation. I believe uh, if you can hear me, I'm not seeing the presentation at all at the moment. Can you put your volume up, David? I can. Okay. Can you hear me now? Still the same. Higher? Need it higher yet. Okay, I'm just doing it now. How about now? That's better. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yep. Higher? Yeah. Okay. I'm also not seeing the presentation, Philippe. Just a second. Do you see it now? No. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I can do this. I have the presentation in front of me as long as you're able to click through the slides, Philippe. I will. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, good morning. My name is David Johnson from Integration Technology. I apologize for the difficulties with the uh, technology. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, ultraviolet curing lamps, uh, a little bit about the systems that they go into, uh, about their safety and about their, um, their use in, in printing. Um, so if we click through to the uh, slide number four, and then slide number five, and slide number six. So the common thing between all of these slides is that they are um, UV curing technology, uh, uses of UV curing technology. So when you go to the nail bar, as I do regularly, um, your nails are painted whatever colour you like, um, the, uh, and you stick your fingers into that machine, that machine is ultraviolet curing. Uh, when you go to the dentist and have a filling, that is also ultraviolet curing. The wavelengths vary slightly between these uh, types of curing, but they are all forms of ultraviolet curing. And I'm sure you would recognise the middle slide, which was of a wide format printer. And on this, there's two UV lamps, one each side of the, uh, the print carriage. Um, so what is UV light? Um, slide number seven, please. Um, UV light sits between x-rays, uh, which you use in the radiography, typically, um, for, the, uh, for, for, for having x-rays on your bones, and visible light. So that's the light that your eyes can pick up and actually see when you go outside or under the lights in your office. Um, Typically, the part of the UV spectrum that we use for UV curing is between uh, 200 and 420 nanometers. 
and we break this down slightly further into three different areas um, short wave, medium wave and long wave known as UVC, UV and UVA. Um, the, most commonly way, the most common way to generate light, uh, UV light for curing processes between print is using a medium pressure mercury arc lamp. Um, it's a very technical term, basically it's a fluorescent bulb that's a bit more powerful and got different things inside it. Um, the, there are other ways of doing this, um, including microwave generated lamps. Um, there is a company called Fusion who produce a lamp that, is, uh, that, that generates UV light using a microwave oven. Very similar, a bit more powerful to the microwave oven in your kitchen. And also there are newer technologies such as, such as Exciner lamps. Um, this is a slightly different type of lamp. And also uh, LED systems are coming along now as well. Um, and they're just different ways of generating UV light. So if we move on to slide 8, just this should give you a visible uh, uh, idea of where the uh, uh, UV sits between X-rays and visible light. And the top end of UV light is, is actually bordering on the edge of visible light. So some of the longer waves of UV your eyes can actually pick up. And if you see them, they're extremely purple. So, what, what is a medium pressure mercury arc lamp? How is it made? Um, the lamp itself is made of a quartz envelope. And I use the word quartz rather than glass because they are different materials. Uh, glass is not uh, transparent to UV light, certainly not at the shorter wavelengths. Um, and there's an example of this. If you go into your greenhouse in your garden, um, you don't get a suntan. And the reason is the UV light doesn't penetrate the uh, glass. Um, so we have a quartz tube, and in the end of the tubes, we stick two electrodes, uh, and we, we hold those in place in various different wheels, uh, different ways. Um, uh, typically, in the, in the systems that we use, we use uh, a capillary tube to hold them, which is, uh, is then melted down onto the electrode and, and welded into the end of the tube. Or we can use a pinch seal as well, and our sub-zero range of lamps uses a pinch seal. And what this is, is the electrode is put in place, and then the the quartz is got very, very hot and molten, and then you basically put it in a clamp to create a seal at the end of the lamp. Finally, what goes in the lamp is important as well. Um, you need a, an inert gas, as you do in any fluorescent lamp, to actually get the arc to, uh, to strike and remain stable. And then we also, inside the lamp, put other stuff, and mostly in, in UV lamps, medium pressure, mercury arc lamps, the key word there is mercury, uh, and that's the key component inside a mercury arc lamp. We do put other things inside the lamp, such as iron, or uh, gallium, or indium, or sometimes even lead. And this will just change the spectral output of the lamp slightly, and it's used to tune the lamp to the ink. And the way I would describe that, it's, it's like tuning your car. So if you want your, your car to be economical, you take it down to the garage, and you, ask, you can ask them to remap the engine so that it's more economical. Conversely, you want a high performance car and you want better acceleration, you can do the same thing, you can have them remap it. And this is just like doping a UV lamp. Fundamentally, it's the same lamp at the same power with the same outputs, but you get them to skew the output slightly or offset the output slightly so that you get a, a better performance with your particular ink. Um, so the, the electrode, to actually get the lamp running, you will, what you need to do is apply a high voltage spike to the electrodes. This is usually an AC spike um, and it's usually done with an igniter. In some of the electronic systems, the igniter can be, the ignition spike can be created inside the electronic power supply. In the older systems, you'll find a thing that's like a big round silver capacitor and in fact, it's, that's the igniter as well. You have igniters in present lights in your office as well and it's the, sometimes called the starter. Then you also need on the back of that a, a power supply that will limit the current. Once the lamp strikes, you have an arc between the two electrodes, it becomes a short circuit. So you need something to prevent all the fuses in the factory blowing uh, because all the current is drawn by the lamp. Um, when you strike the arc, the arc, the lamp starts to get hot. And as the lamp gets hot, the metals inside the lamp, so the mercury and any of the other metals if they're present, uh, evaporate. When they evaporate, they start to emit photons, and when they're emitting photons, 
the, um, the, the, that's the UV light coming out and that's the, the, the light that we use for curing. Now a UV lamp typically will produce 60% infrared radiation, 10% uh, visible light radiation and 30% uh, UV radiation. So only 30% of the electrical input power is being converted to UV light. Moving on, how do we use them in printers? So clearly the, the UV lamps are a light curing process. Um, so there are initiators in the ink that react uh, to the UV light. The initiators then uh, uh, kick off a reaction in the monomers inside the ink and the ink then polymerizes or becomes, uh, changes state into a, uh, effectively a plastic. And you can actually, in some of the electronics industries, they do use this for creating an insulating layer on, on, a, on a circuit board or on, on a component. Um, in an inkjet head, the lamps are usually mounted each side of or after the inkjet head. So in a single pass application, you need one lamp after the inkjet head. Or in a, in a wide format printer where the head traverses and the inkjet traverses, you typically need one lamp on each side of the head so that the ink is cured immediately after printing. And the object here is to uh, keep the dot uh, it, as a dot shape so it doesn't uh, expand and you lose resolution in the print. And that's why the lamps are relatively close to the inkjet heads. You do have to be careful how close you put them to the inkjet heads because sprayed back UV light will cure the ink that's on the bottom of the head and that will gum up your heads and um, be a rather costly repair. So if we move on to slide 12, um, the printer here is, uh, is um, an inkjet printer, wide format inkjet printer. It's, it's an old Zunt printer. Um, and you can see I've, I've indicated with the arrows where the lamps are. And I'm sure if you have a printer like this in your factory, you will recognize this kind of setup um, pretty easily. Um, slide 13. How are, so, so we're using the lamps in these printers. Um, we can, the lamps wear out, the lamps have a set life and the reason is that the electrodes erode uh, over the life of the lamp. If you think of the electrodes in a lamp as an arc welder, um, you have a, a welding rod that wears down as you, as you weld two pieces of metal together. You're not welding metal in this case, but you have an electrode the same that is sputtering an arc out of it, and that is, is, is very molten. Now, the electrodes are made of some pretty clever materials. There's molybdenum in there, there's titanium, and there's various different oxides in there. And the object is to reduce the amount of sputtering and the amount of material that's sputtered into the lamp. Because once the lamp is, once the... Uh, it, once the electrode sputters and the material is given off, the material will, com will combine with the other metals in the lamp. And this is uh, worse when you have a doped lamp. Um, so if you have iron in there, it's much more reactive than mercury and wants to combine with the other metals that are in the lamp with, the, with, with what's being emitted from the electrode. And uh, that, that then joins together, it uh, forms another compound, and the compound is deposited on the end of the uh, UV lamp. And as you will see um, in some of the other pictures in a moment, this is usually seen as black marks on the lamp or black rings around the end. And usually this will start at the end of the lamp because that's the coldest area of the lamp and where this will condense out of solution the first. Um, in this picture on um, slide 13, uh, you will see the, uh, a cassette system for changing the lamp. So this is changing the whole cassette rather than changing the lamp. And the object of this is to make it really easy, a very simple procedure, a very fast procedure to change the lamp. A bit like changing an inkjet cartridge in your desktop printer. We move on now to slide 14. This is a family of UV lamps. Um, so on the left you have what we call our V0 range of lamps. These are bigger, heavier uh, UV lamps. And you can see the lamps at the bottom left hand corner of the picture. And this is a lamp change system. So you are actually making electrical connections using a screwdriver, making sure that you put the reflectors back in the correct place, uh, and that's a lamp change. The, uh, the uh, black uh, lamp heads on the right-hand side of the picture are um, sub-zero lamp systems, and these ones are generally meant for a cassette lamp change. So the lamp is held in a brand new cassette. The object is not to increase the price too far of changing the whole cassette. And when you do change the cassette, you get a new reflector every time. So you're putting your system back to uh, prime 
prime position, if you like, with a new reflector as well as a new lamp, so you should get back to 100% output. So, as we were discussing, the lamp does age. Uh, in the next couple of uh, slides, slides 15 and 16, um, give some of the influences on on the uh, on how the lamps uh, age. So, as I said earlier, the electrodes uh, spatter, and that creates material. Dope lamps, uh, material that condenses and combines with the stuff that's in the lamp. Dope lamps, where they're using iron and gallium. Um, uh, tend to be more, t tend to have a much shorter life, typically half the life of the normal mercury arc lamp. The um, things that can make your system cure not so well, obviously the age of the bulb, but how clean the lamp is, if, depending on which UV your system you have, uh, if you have a positively cooled system, are you blowing ink fly from the inkjet head straight onto the lamp, and is that then coating the lamp and preventing output? So you need to make sure the lamp is clean, how clean is the reflector. Is it still a reflector? Um, they, they, just by putting the, la the lamp in a, in a uh, just put, by putting the reflector close to the lamp, you start to destroy the aluminium of the reflector. Um, and that, so the reflector only lasts for a given amount of time, um, certainly at peak performance. The other one is, as I said earlier, this is a, um, a light process. Therefore, uh, just like your eyeglasses, if your eyeglasses are dirty, you can't see through them. Um, the, the UV lamp, if the quartz in front of the lamp, if it's fitted, is dirty, then the UV light can't see through that. So it's really important that that is kept, kept absolutely spots and clean. So if you have a, a, a head crash and you wipe ink onto the uh, quartz at the bottom in front of the lamp, you really need to clean that off before you go any further. The longer you leave it, the harder it is to clean. Um, and there are, there are ways that you can do that. Um, curing as well is a subjective thing. There are, it's a whole different uh, conversation or different webinar that we can put together just on measuring UV light output. The problem is this is not like measuring centimeters or volts or anything like that. There is no defined um, uh, uh, calibrated um, parameter that you can actually measure this. So the, uh, we, we talk about milliwatts and millijoules, which is to do with uh, intensity and dose, but every instrument measures this in a different range. They still call them milliwatts and millijoules, but then you can't take the instrument from one person and move it to another one, and uh, that, that, that will be an equal measurement. Um, if we move on to slide 17, this is a bunch of lamps that uh, are looking, starting to look quite old. Um, if you look towards the left-hand end, you'll see the, uh, the very dark, smoky lamp there. Um, this, is, this, this lamp has been abused for whatever reason, and you can see that it's starting to, uh, it's starting to uh, wear out, basically. It's, it's got a heavy usage in life. If you look in the middle, uh, interestingly, the lamp right in the middle has a yellow end. Uh, this is uh, not. Th this is the other stuff apart from mercury that's in the lamp. In this case, it's uh, probably lead. Um, and what's actually happening is the uh, this this is probably a needing new lamp, and the lamp needs to be struck. But then that will all evaporate, and then you won't see it again afterwards. This is just part of the testing procedure of when the lamp is built new. If we move on to slide 18, um, it's not a great picture because it's a lamp in a lamp head. But you can see the deposits on the lamp from uh, uh, external contamination in this case. And in this case, this was dust that was in the air. Um, when these lamps are running, the lamp surface temperature is around 850 to 900 degrees Celsius. Um, and at that point, the surface of the quartz is plastic. And so anything that gets on there effectively melts into the surface of the quartz. And it's it then becomes a hot spot in the lamp, so heat is attracted to that area, and you can get damage in the uh, lamp uh, at, at that point because it's so hot. Um, if you remember when you change your car headlights, you're not supposed to touch the, the glass envelope for the halogen lamp because it gets so hot and the grease from your fingers will create a hot spot and uh, cause uh, a, a premature failure of the lamp, and it's the same with the UV lamp. So. 
you know, we all hear these days that UV light is dangerous, um, so perhaps we ought to talk about, sorry, moving on to slide 19, uh, perhaps we ought to talk about some of the risks involved with using UV lamps. Um, UV lamps in general have four key areas of, of uh, risk that you need to pay attention to. Um, ozone, UV light, heat and mercury. The one I intend to concentrate on today is uh, the UV light one and the mercury one. Um, the other two are taken care of by the machinery manufacturer. Um, so clearly he couldn't supply you with a machine that's producing ozone. Um, ozone is uh, not toxic as such, but if you were to be in a room full of ozone, you would die of suffocation. You can't breathe ozone. Um, you can smell ozone before it's at anywhere near a dangerous level. Um, so I don't intend to go any further because the machinery actually address that issue. Um, the heat issue, yes, the lamp is very hot, but again, under the uh, regulations when they supply a UV system, sorry, a, a printer, they should have taken into account the, uh, the danger from heat that the UV lamp might present. Um, so, moving on to the UV light uh, hazard, which uh, is slide 20. Um, UV light is dangerous. Um, you hear the stories in the news, you know, uh, a lot of the weather forecasts have a, a UV light uh, uh, output setting or uh, measurement where they say it's a high risk day or whatever it is. Um, and so UV light has got some hazards, but we need to break down the UV light again into the sections. Um, so UVA, the, the long wavelength UV light, is uh, pretty uh, safe. Um, and in, at this stage, it would be good to go onto slide 21, please, Philippe. Um, the, uh, it's a much safer UV light. It's, it's not the cancer causing uh, UV light and it doesn't damage your eyesight. UVB and UVC are what um, suntan creams try and prevent you being damaged with, your skin being damaged with. So UVB and UVC are the uh, dangerous wavelengths. Um, and if you have a look at slide 21, which is on the, on the screen now, um, you can see the exposure time from UVC and UVB is much, much less. So the, on the left-hand side of this graph is, is effectively the amount of exposure you can have in terms of energy because of the time that it gives it you energy. So you're only allowed to have a much lower level of exposure to UVB than UVA. Um, and just to give you an idea, if we move on to slide 22, the spectral output of um, a UV lamp is, is shown here. So you can see if you compare slide 21 with 22, the UVB output of a UV lamp is very significant. So you do need, you don't want to be looking into the front of a UV lamp. If you take it off of the machine for any reason, you don't want to be switching it on and shining it on anyone. This is really quite dangerous things. And from a personal point of view, um, you know, a, you need to be wearing um, uh, you need to, if you're working with any lamps that are uh, exposed in the workplace, not when they're in their normal position on the printer, because again, the manufacturer will have dealt with this issue. But if you take the lamp head off for any reason and start lighting it for maintenance or something like that, then you should have all your skin covered and you should be wearing uh, dark glasses if you're trying to switch the lamp on. And dark glasses, polycarbonate glasses, uh, do give you a fairly good protection from UV light. Okay. Moving on to slide 23, um, the final part of this, um, how should we deal with lamps? How do you manipulate them, clean them, and how do you dispose of them? Okay. You should try and store any UV lamps you get horizontally. Uh, the reason is mercury is quite heavy, and if you store the lamp vertically for a long period of time, the mercury will gradually migrate to the bottom of the lamp and will end up behind the electric coupling lamp. So you should really try and store the lamp in a, in a horizontal position so that this can't happen. The, um, if When you get a new lamp, the first thing you should do before you take it out of the packaging is shake it. You shake it quite vigorously. Now you do need to be careful. They are made of uh, quartz, which is a glass like real, so if you drop them or bash them with a hammer or anything, they're going to smash just the same as anything else that's made of glass. Um, but you can shake them quite vigorously, and this is just trying to distribute and break up the mercury that will try and uh, retriculate into a, a liquid blob. And if you're not careful, if you're storing the lamp on its end behind the electrode, the danger of this is that this is the coldest part of the lamp, 
when the uh, lamp is struck and uh, therefore the mercury doesn't get hot enough to evaporate and then your lamp won't cure. Um, and so it's really important that you try and break up the mercury before you just put them in. You can do the same thing with a new cassette. If you get a new cassette, just shake the whole cassette quite vigorously in your hand before you put it into the system. If you need to clean the lamp or the reflector or the quartz, you should be using uh, isopropanol alcohol on a lint-free cloth. You don't want to leave any deposits on the lamp at all. Um, if you touch a lamp with your finger, you need to, religiously you need to clean this afterwards using isopropanol alcohol. The grease from your fingers will create will burn into the surface of the lamp and will create a hot spot which will reduce the life of the lamp. Um, the same with the reflector. If you get grease from your fingers on the reflector or grease from anything else on the reflector, if you don't clean it, you'll create a hot spot on the reflector. And that actually in the reflector can quite easily create a hole in the reflector. Um, the quartz, back to what I said earlier, uh, the quartz plate underneath the lamp, if you, uh, if you don't have a clean piece of quartz, you can't, the, the ink can't see the UV lamp, and that will reduce the amount of curing that you have. Um, the key thing here is that uh, sometimes the, the, the quartz sits in line with the UV lamp, so it's being exposed to UV light all the time. So any ink you get on that quartz plate will cure very, very well. So the earlier you can get it off, the better the chance you've got of keeping your quartz plate without having to replace it. Um, with lamp quartz plates, um, you are quite lucky, certainly for a while. If you do bake on the ink, you can use a razor blade, very carefully of course, um, to scrape it like a, it's like having a shave. You can scrape off the uh, um, uh, ink that's baked onto the front of the UV lamp. However, you've got to be careful not to scratch the quartz. Um, finally, the uh, mercury uh, inside the lamp is hazardous. So if you have a lamp breakage, you need to, you need to clean up the mercury as well as the quartz that breaks uh, very carefully. Um, and you need to dispose of any lamps and any breakages. In, uh, you need to treat them as hazardous waste. Uh, that varies from country to country how that's done. Uh, for instance, in the UK, we have, we have to use a special bin that we put our hazardous waste into. Okay, um, that's the presentation as it stands. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have now. Um, thank you very much. All right, I'll open the chat for your questions. So, chat is open. If you have any questions, you can ask them. I'll also change the setting a bit like this right <clears throat> why are some printers using bulbs and cassettes and some aren't David okay the it's just a choice thing um, clearly uh, when we designed lamps with cassettes we we designed it to make it as simple and as fast for the operator of the machine to change them. Um, as I've just said in, in the presentation, a lot of the uh, lamps, uh, you don't want to contaminate the lamps with any dirt or moisture or get your fingers on them. And by doing it as a cassette, it's a much easier way to change the lamp and you can effectively de-skill changing the lamps. Um, they both have the same effect. The other, the other effect of having a cassette is you put a new reflector in every time. So you are resetting the, the curing to 100% every time, assuming that any port plate below the lamp is clean. Um, All right. so. See a couple of other uh, people coming up with questions, or at least typing. Mm -hmm. I've got a question in the meantime, uh, David. Let's say that I have one lamp. I've got a two-lamp system, UV printer with two lamps. I've got one lamp that is contaminated, right? Mm -hmm. Um, is it a good idea to only replace that one lamp or should I replace it in pairs and why? If you want ultimate process control you should change both lamps because the lamps do degrade over the age of the lamp. They don't just switch off. It's, uh, at the end of their life usually a lamp still works electrically but you get low output and therefore you don't get a good cure. So if you only change one of them um, you're now liable to get one lamp that's curing much better than the other lamp and this can give you Problems with your print quality, the art, you can get artifacts in your print, and you probably banding and stuff like that. Exactly, you can get banding, 
but also you, you just doesn't cure as well and, and, and you'll end up with being confused as to what's going on and which lamp yeah. has been changed and which lamp hasn't. So right. it's usually best to replace both at the same time. Okay. So we've got a question from Juan Carlos. What could be the reason for ink deposits on the protecting glasses of LED dryers? Fantastic. It's a good question, this. Um, usually there's only two reasons for getting ink on the glass of, a, uh, of an LED dryer. Firstly, you touch the media. Now, especially with an LED dryer, you have to run the LEDs very close to the media. And it's very easy to touch it onto the media. And if you've got wet ink on there, that will deposit on the glass and then you will dry it on there. The other reason is if you're getting a lot of ink mist from the uh, inkjet heads themselves. So this is just stuff that's floating around in the air as a microparticle. That tends to be, for some reason, it tends to be attracted to the glass and deposits on the glass. And again, that will cure on there. And they're really the only two reasons that you would get ink on there, unless you paint it on there or something. I see a question from Hugo. Is the substrate paper film type important in the curing process? Right. Uh, I see the question as well. And will it harm the lamp? It won't harm the lamp in any way unless it uh, catches fire or uh, melts or something and fumes are given off. But the, the lamp itself doesn't see what the substrate is. The uh, lamp also does the curing process is affected by how porous the paper is. Um, so generally, uh, it's regarded that you can cure on paper that's not coated much better than paper that is coated. Having said that, in reality, if you actually do a proper check using counting the double bonds that are made when you actually create the curing, mm -hmm. um, it's actually harder to cure because the, the paper fibers themselves obscure some of the ink. Now, it depends how you measure curing. If you're measuring curing like most people do with a rub test, or sticking yeah. their fingernail on it, porous paper is going to feel much better than coated paper. Um, but in, if you do a proper test under a microscope and count the double bonds, the, the actual curing is better because the UV light can see it when it's sitting up on top of a non-porous substrate. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? What is a typical um, uh, lamp life for a full mercury lamp? So not a lamp that contains iron or any other doping, as you call it. A mercury lamp, what is average lamp right, life? It, it obviously depends on the systems, but uh, most, most, uh, UV, mer most mercury UV lamps are guaranteed for 1,000, some for 2,000 hours. Um, and it, it really depends on the process as well. Yeah. Um, what would short you have what's called a curing window. What would, what would shorten it? Um, what would short? Sorry, carry on. No, no. What would shorten it? Um, I, I I read somewhere that um, the more you ignite it, the 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 shorter the life will be. So exactly. From, the, the, from you're printer, right. Exactly. From the printer's point of view, it would be a good idea uh, if you have a UV printer to actually uh, have it run in one go. You know, not spread the work through the entire day if you only have four hours of work. And just do that in one go. Yeah, um, but let's not exaggerate this too much either. When what you don't want to be doing is switching the lamp on and off between every sheet. You know, if you're running a flatbed printer, you put one sheet on, you go away for a cup of tea at the end of it, and you come back. Sorry, coffee, and you come back at the end of it and restrike the lamps. That would be bad. But if you have 20 sheets to print, print all 20 sheets, then take your break. If you're if you're starting the lamp three or four times a day, this is not a significant change to the life of the lamp. If you're, yeah. change, if you're starting the lamp you know, five or six times every hour, that will affect the, uh, affect the life of the lamp. And the, and the reason is that the hardest time for the electrodes is when the lamp is striking before it's hot. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's when you get the most sputter. So the more times you start it, the more times you get sputter off of the lamp. Um, other things that can affect the life of the lamp, obviously overheating, um, if the lamp becomes too hot. Now bear in mind that we need to have the lamp at over 650 degrees centigrade just to evaporate the mercury and potentially any iron in there. Mm -hmm. But we need to keep it below 950 degrees centigrade, otherwise you risk melting the, the um, uh, quartz itself. Yeah. You, we have to, all of us, all of the UV manufacturers are, are playing a balancing game here. And if, if you're outside of those uh, areas, you could overheat the lamp and you could then shorten the life. You get what they call pinholing. 
So keeping your, your pans and lamp filters in good condition is uh, essential. Absolutely. Exactly, yeah. Question. And also keeping the lamp clean so you don't get hot spots on the lamp as well. If you put yeah. your finger on the lamp, clean it. Yeah, don't touch it it's with it, your... Use cotton, it's cotton it's gloves. It's, yeah, that's right. You know, uh, you know, only handle the lamp by the ends. Don't don't touch the port. You can really, really avoid it. It, it's, it sounds so simple, but it actually makes quite a big difference to the life of the lamp. And the, yeah. <laughs> the longer the life you get at your lamps. So Yura asks if uh, different life lengths can be uh, of the left and right lamp, like we already discussed, affect uh, the color. And um, we agree that it will have uh, create some print artifacts. You will see banding. The color itself, probably yes. In, in my experience, it does. There's also a question from Josef. What is better for UV lamps service life when there is a 15 minute pause between prints? Should I leave the lamp switch on or should I switch the lamp off, cool it and then start again after 15 minutes pause? Okay, I, w I would, uh, 15 minutes, you're right on the borderline between the two. Uh, I would leave the lamp running, um, especially if you've got a low power standby. Um, yeah. 15 minutes is the kind of cutoff time. If you're going away for one hour for lunch, no, switch it off. If you're, 15 minutes is kind of where you want to be making, probably leaving it on. Is the uh, amount of ink that goes onto the substrate, does that affect uh, the lamp? Would it be more stressed or less stressed, as asked by Hugo? Right, the, the lamp doesn't see how much ink you put down. The lamp has no idea how much ink you're putting down whatsoever, so, that, so the lamp itself is not more stressed. Having said that, the more ink you put down, the harder it is to cure. Therefore, you need the lamp in a better condition. You need more output from the lamp. So as the lamp life gets older, you will find it harder to cure uh, heavier film coverages of ink. Um, and you know, when you if you're trying to do a 200% black or something, that's uh, uh, quite hard to cure. Interestingly, usually the hardest color to cure is white. And the reason white is hard to cure is because the pigment used in white ink is titanium dioxide, and titanium di dioxide reflects the UV light very well. Um, and, and again, inkjet seems to be a little bit different. If you go to offset printing or flexo printing or something like that, black inks are usually regarded as being quite difficult to cure. For some reason in inkjet inks, and it's apparently something to do with the pigments that are being used, yellow is quite hard to cure, and so is magenta. And so it's a, it's a bit of a it's a bit of an odd in that respect, but, but, but certainly some colours are harder to cure than others, and the thicker the film coverage, the harder it is to cure. Yeah, because if you have a thick layer of ink, to put it in this way, you need more curing to have the correct adhesion, so that would affect lamp life, or, or, or at least uh, have some effect on it, no? Absolutely. Um, the, the thicker the film, the further the light, and you're talking about light again, has got to penetrate through the ink film to cure them the lower layers of the ink. Now, it, there's some interesting things here as well. Lamps, if, if you remember the spectral output that I put on the screen in the presentation, you see you had UVB, UVC and UVA. Typically, we would say the UVA does the through curing. So if you're, use, if you're using very thick blacks and whites and things like that, then you need lots of UVA to get that cured. If you want to get a good surface cure, a really hard cure on a, a rigid substrate or something, then you're much uh, it's much more critical to get UVC output from the lamp, which is at the opposite end of the spectral output, um, because the UVC overcomes a thing called um, oxygen inhibition. So um, oxygen slows the reaction time, and the shorter wave UV is much more aggressive, and it, although there's less coming out, it actually cures the surface very well, but it won't penetrate the surface. So. Yes, Steve, that's what we were saying. If you have uh, different uh, left and right lamps in terms of, of power, then you could see banding. Um, even if you would use uh, curing with both lamps on, so not leading and not trailing, you would still, uh, depending of course on the substrate, be able to see banding. Question coming in from Hugo and Kristen. Okay. Just to comment on the banding, banding is a very interesting one with, uh, which you, you only see with UV printers really. If you imagine you've got an inkjet head that is moving across a, a stationary surface at something like 60 meters a minute or slightly more, a meter a second. Um, when you have a droplet, it drops out of the um, uh, inkjet head as a round globe, a sphere, more or less, it, it doesn't matter. But then you, when it hits the surface of the substrate, 
it immediately deforms because it's decelerating massively as it hits the surface. And then the UV lamp comes across and cures it. So if the UV lamp is very close to the droplet, you get a, a very, um, a dis, uh, a very um, misshapen dot, and it will cure it in that. But of course, when you go back the other way, printing direct, bidirectionally, the droplet is in the opposite side. And that is some of the banding that you can see. <coughs> All right. Are UV lamps developed with, for specific inks together with the ink manufacturers? So are you working together with the ink manufacturers? Yes and no. Uh, yes. Um, what happens is it's usually with the... In, we would normally say there's a tripartite way of developing... Uh, something. So the reason we have dope lamps is because the ink manufacturers have said, hey, I'd like more through cure, or I want more surface cure, or whatever it is. Um, and, and especially when inkjet first came along, the film thicknesses in inkjet are quite thick. So that we're particularly looking for ways of, excuse me, of increasing the UVA output. So we were adding things to the lamps that increase the UVA output. Uh, and we actually call it a, an A-bulb in, in, our, part, in, in our, our lamps. And what this does is it moves the spectral output, bit of the spectral output to the UVA area, gives you better through cure for thicker films. But what happens is that, and this was back in 2002, 2003 when they were first coming out, this was much more of a, a thing that was going on then. Nowadays, uh, the ink manufacturers are becoming much cleverer at the way they make inks, and they're reverting back to standard mercury lamps, which is great for the end user because you actually get a longer life with a mercury lamp. because yeah. Anything you put in with the mercury is basically a contaminant. Um, so we're, we're again walking this narrow type path of adding contaminants to change the output of the lamp, but not adding too many to shorten the life of the lamp too much. And I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to turn around and say the life of the lamp is too short, but uh, yeah. this is a balancing act. <laughs> okay. All right. That's great. Um, of course, the, the recording of this webinar will be available again on uh, our support website, uh, where you can watch it again. Um, if you have any further questions, you can send them to webinar at digiprint-suppliers.com. We'll be happy to answer them. If we don't know the answer, of course, we'll ask David. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you, David. And I uh, hope to see you all again next month for the next webinar. Cheers.